Arts conducted by um, commissioned by the River Coalition of Cambodia, which look into the impact of the low flow of the water uh, and how it impacts to the Mekong and the Tunle Sap community. Um, the, the result from the research actually reinforce that uh, water scarcity um, for agriculture due to the drought in the Mekong River system and the Tunle Sap have caused instability to the water demand and the supply. And the data of the um, low flow is actually um, reinforced the findings from the Mekong River Commission studies, as well as uh, the studies that have taken place in the region. And uh, especially in 2019 and 2020, the river have dropped below the historical uh, long record, long-term record average and even close to historical minimum value, which impact on the ability um, in agriculture production as well as uh, a fishery production. Um, in the small table down below, you can see in terms of the catch, a freshwater fishery catch that uh, continue to decline. And this, this is the report uh, coming from Ministry of Agriculture, Fishery and Forestry. So, um, that is the figure at the national level when we are talking to Fisher, they also share with us about the changes that they they have experienced, uh, low level of water, which means that um, Fisher have to, uh, first of all, they cannot rely on their local knowledge in terms of seasonal changes uh, for the season that they usually able to catch fish. Uh, now it's not possible to have the catch as before. Uh, they have to spend longer times and travel further into the lake in order to catch very small amount for their uh, household uh, consumption. You can go to next one, please. Um, so this is uh, from another uh, part of the country. Um, this is from the Mekong River system. Uh, the photo is taken um, as we are hosting um, one uh, of the influencer uh, to take a boat trip along three provinces um, in 3S region, Ratanakiri province down to Stung Trang and also uh, Kerajah province. So Stung Trang and Kerajah is upper part of the Mekong in Cambodia. Um, and Stung Trang is very, very close to the it's actually the border province with Lao PDR, and in the Lao side, there is a Don Sahong hydropower dam in operation. Um, the picture you are seeing on the screen is the massive falls of the tree in the Ramsa side. So, uh, local villagers have observed the continuous uh, fall downs of tree in massive number due to changes of uh, flow regime of the water. So, when there is a uh, dry season, there is more water, and then uh, rainy season, the, the, the flow is not as high as before. And, and this is one um, very evident of change that uh, we are seeing it's just some 20 kilometer down from Don Sahong. There's also um, evidence of the changes in the flow that affect to the key biodiversity, such as the Mekong Irrawaddy dolphin. So the dolphin is very a uh, key resource that attract to uh, local tourism. And unfortunately, and very sadly, the last dolphin in uh, Long Chertil near to uh, uh, border died in February uh, this year. So uh, in Cambodia, we only have uh, one significant site that still have the dolphin in uh, Kampi in uh, Karachek province. So uh, those, those are very unfortunate that all the changes around the deep pool that the dolphin have uh, survived for so long have, have caused a uh, dramatic impact to the last dolphin. Uh, we also uh, see that there's appearance of the giant stingray, um, which has been caught by the fisher and um, some programs such as the wonder of the Mekong have released its back into the river. So the stingray has not uh, made its appearance very often, but the, the changes in the ecosystem have kind of confused um, certain species in the river. Um, yes, and the same narrative that shared by the community in terms of 
uh, the, the time that is needed to uh, go fishing, uh, less fish that is catch, and then there are certain species of the fish that the fisher notice that has been disappeared. Um, there are some type of fish that um, appear, but in a very smaller size. So these are all the changes that uh, local people have observed. And um, I think uh, oftentimes their local knowledge and observation has not make, uh, make their ways into a very uh, key content in the media. I think uh, the media capture more um, information from big studies uh, that often uh, draw on very scientific data and analysis, but the, the experience of the local people that live and depend on the river and know the river system is, uh, I think, being missed from this narrative. If we can go to the next one. Um, I, I just want to share a little bit. This is the most recent uh, forum that we have facilitated for women in the uh, fishery uh, sector to come together and share the experience. Some of the quote, uh, the, uh, the media article from the left is, is not from Cambodia. I have to share. It is from Laos PDA, but the community that were interviewed in this media is from Don Sahong village, which is very, very close to the Cambodia side. And the, yeah, their observation has been, uh, and I quote from there, plentiful of fish, I think in the past. Um, the question that they have now is how to make the long-term shifting for community that live close by to the hydropower dam operation um, to shifting this kind of fishing village to a more sustainable and commercial farming community. So the shift of their livelihood is really uh, challenging for local people whose ways of life in so far have relied on the river and fishing activities. Um, quotes from the right is from one of the young women leader in the community that we work with. They observe on the, the flow of the Mekong River have changed and that it has impact on the ability of the river to have a fishery. And I think echo uh, same sentiment as the fisher from the lake where they have to spend much more time uh, to, to catch and so on. Uh, next one, please. So I think... Um, this is the narrative that we have heard from the local people. Sometimes how to make the content inform on certain key decision in the region is, is a big challenge for program like us that, that try to promote uh, local people and, and the richness of their knowledge. Um, Pipai talk about the uh, most recent APEX meeting in Thailand. Uh, Cambodia also just hosts the ASEAN summit. Uh, few weeks ago. And one of the key content that were discussed during the ASEAN summit is around transitioning energy uh, in the region in so far have largely depend on, as we have seen in, in the Mekong region, largely depend on uh, construction of hydropower dam on the mainstream of the Mekong River and the tributary river for energy, uh, electricity and energy needs. But how can we balance extracting from the river resource that have put pressure on the river system itself, causing environmental and social and negative impact to local livelihood. How can we bring development that does not only give importance to one size, but also balance and, and looking to the social and environmental uh, consideration for millions of people in the, in the region that depend on this. And, um, from where we are, we are advocating more on uh, energy transition that is just, uh, that is socially inclusive, that consider environmental um, con environmental uh, consideration in that. And it's not just only shifting in the technology and infrastructure choices, but uh, recentering the energy as the basis for human prosperity and not just on economic growth. And I think I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And let me directly invite our last panelist, Achan Carl Middleton. The floor is yours, Achan. Thank you very much. Um, maybe can I borrow that clicking thing? Thanks. It works. My eyes. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I will. 
not always sure how to follow up three really good speakers, to be honest, on the same issue of, of the future of rivers in the region. I'll do my best to like, add a little bit. Um, so actually, um, the, this really important point on how people live in the river basin has already been very clearly um, described, both in terms of um, the kind of past practices and the relationship between the kind of ecological and hydrological characteristics of the river and how some of the changes are starting to occur in terms of low flow. Um, I think one thing I want to kind of convey as the first point of the presentation is just the rate of change of, of how the river is changing. Um, according to one study, um, as of 2008, only 2%, well, not only, 2% of the river basins uh, water flow was stored behind large dams but as of 2030 it could be as much as 20 percent of the of the water that flows in the river over the year so the the point that i want to kind of make is actually things are changing very quickly um, and within the next uh, decade or so could change even more profoundly um, this this graph uh, tries to show the growing extent of megawatts of hydropower in the basin um, again, just to be brief, because I want to get on to the more uh, recent points by the end of the presentation, you can see that although there's been construction of some dams, mainly in Northeast Thailand since the 1960s, um, it's only since the 1990s, so the time is along the, along the x-axis at the bottom, it's only since the 1990s that the growth that, or the construction of large hydropower dams has really accelerated. Um, the top is uh, projects in China. And then you can see there's a growing number of projects in Laos and Vietnam. Um, so both tributary projects and mainstream projects more recently. Uh, so to give you a sense, as of 2019, there were 89 medium and large scale dams in the lower basin and a further 14 dams under construction and 30 at a planning stage. And in China, uh, 12 large dams on the mainstream and another 95 on the tributaries. And again, most of this um, being a transformation since the 1990s. Where does this electricity go? I think this is a really important, um, I mean, as Ajahn May was pointing out, kind of administrative disconnects, also disconnects between the ecological unit of the river basin and where electricity flows to. Um, so Sam earlier in the previous presentation was pointing out how Western China was being seen as the source of resources for economic de development, I guess, more to the uh, Southeast. Well, the hydropower is an important part of um, that trajectory with um, large dams in Yunnan province and um, other provinces nearby, exporting their electricity since the 1990s to the southeastern seaboard. But I think this is also a kind of connects to questions of uh, social justice or environmental justice or ecological justice in the sense that the changes that take place locally on river basins or even at the river basin scale are connected to benefits that extend well beyond the watershed of the river basin. Um, in one paper, I thought of this as the kind of shift from seeing the river as a watershed to a power shed. It's kind of almost like a rescaling. I think this is quite important in terms of thinking about the justice dimension, as I mentioned. In, in the first panel, um, there was a question that was raised about kind of who owns policy sectors. Um, and I think this is very relevant for a discussion on water as well. Um, who owns the water of the of the of the Mekong River and um, Joy Deep in the last session brought up the question of like is a state centric logic the best way of approaching transboundary water? Um, I mean, so depending on how you think about transboundary water governance, um, the sharing of a river between states could be understood as some form of state level collective action in the sense seeing the river as some form of commons shared between states. But as was also correctly pointed out earlier on, the, the kind of national interest does not necessarily equate with repairing community interests. There's a, often a disconnect between the interest of repairing communities and their social relationship with the river versus the national interest that tends to translate uh, transboundary rivers into transboundary water resources, where the resource essentially is a is an economic, primarily seen as an economic good. Um, so what I want to kind of then uh, talk about is, well, the river is increasingly witnessing this growing extent of large hydropower dam construction. 
um, which is reallocating the benefits and distributing harms to those in the river. But also we need to recognize who the actors are that are transforming the river basin. So we've mentioned the state, but nowadays um, many of the projects that are being built are largely led by the private sector. Um, so that's not to say that private sector projects may not generate electricity. And um, I guess within the discussion that we'll have in the next panel, there's a question of just energy transition and the role of the private sector. But I think it has a quite important implication when we think about rivers, because it's essentially leading to what Shamali was saying in the first presentation or first panel, the commodification of water, the transformation of water as some form of uh, resource that benefits local people to something that becomes commodified for profit for hydropower instead. So whereas in the 1970s and maybe the early 1980s projects were more state-led, increasingly now they are independent power producers or public-private partnerships. And not to spend too much time on, on this in the interest of time now, but I think this is quite profound because it actually raises questions of like who is governing the rivers? Is it for the public good, the private good? In the case of a public-private partnership, some form of conflation between public and private. Um, and actually this, in my mind, in, to, to my mind, requires a lot more problematization because it has implications for what constitutes the public interest, the national interest, and the public goods. Um, there, there has been a growing kind of, there's, I think there's long been a continuity of thinking about the commons in relation to water, but I think this, is, this discussion needs to be revived, and I'll come back to that a bit later. Um, we haven't really discussed much on the panel yet, like the role of different transboundary intergovernmental organizations like the Mekong River Commission, the Lanchan Mekong Commission. Um, I think what, I won't go into this in great depth, but I'm happy to discuss it in question time, but what we've seen over um, the past couple of years is an intensification of the hydropolitics and the geopolitics uh, around governing the Mekong, um, especially as it's played out in the tensions between uh, China and the US. Um, via various like, aid projects. Um, we, in the period of low flows, there was a lot of focus on to the causes of those low flows, whether it was drought, climate change, the operation of upstream projects, the operation of tributary projects. Um, and then there was a lot of kind of knowledge production around this as well, kind of which largely was trying to place blame in one or the other quarter and in fairly black and white terms. Um, so, this intensification of geopolitics has maybe eased a little bit this year, um, but at the same time, um, it's still a backdrop to understanding transboundary water governance in the Mekong at present. Um, so Chita mentioned about uh, some questions around like data sharing. I think Pai was also pointing towards the issue of public participation. Um, so up until 2019, there was no uh, data sharing in the dry season between China and downstream countries. And this, this in part was um, contributing towards these kind of water data politics of what were the causes of uh, drought and low flows. Um, again, like this could be an, an entire focus of the presentation itself, but I just want to focus on the most recent uh, changes that have happened. So after, a very intense focus onto China's role in the low flows in 2019 and 2020. Um, China has released all year round data, water data of hydrological conditions. Um, but the, the thing I'd want to point out on this is that this increased kind of water data transparency has not really translated into increased accountability mechanisms. So there's still an important disconnect between um, kind of making the river a little bit more visible through data versus the way projects are actually being operated and planned. And I, I think this is an important gap to discuss. Um, with the important work, especially of Thai communities and civil society, like the accountability on transboundary water governance has been um, materialized to a degree in different ways. I think that one of the important um, examples to put onto the table at present is the a case of the Thailand court case, um, where a, a community network working with public interest lawyers and civil society um, tried to question the role of state organizations in uh, funding and approving the Zaibari Dam on the Mekong River's mainstream in Laos, which was the first uh, mainstream project to be built. So, 
and I think maybe Pai could discuss on this more and any questions towards this, the court case lasted for over a decade. Um, the final ruling of the appeal court, uh, so, sorry, the Supreme Court was just announced in August 2022, this, uh, this year, and essentially um, ru didn't rule in favor of the communities who were uh, questioning the approval of the project on a basis that I, to be honest, don't still fully understand. Uh, the, the, the court essentially ruled that the state approving the power purchase agreement um, was not directly response. Sorry, the, the, yeah, the state not approving the power purchase agreement was not, sorry, the state approving the power purchase agreement was not directly responsible for the way in which the project was causing transboundary impacts on the Mekong River, um, which doesn't seem to connect with the way that the project could not go ahead without signing a power purchase agreement. But what is important in this case is that it's an example of civil society and uh, communities testing accountability mechanisms through legal processes on the accountability of project developers and operators. So I want to just, um, in the last few minutes of the presentation, just comment on a few emerging issues that I think are important. The first is on um, the emerging politics of knowledge over impacts. I think a lot of the, um, the public debates, the academic debates, the civil society debates over the last 10 years have been about around what could be the impacts of projects, which has been really important to raise the question of what are the risks of projects that now have been increasingly going ahead, despite evidence demonstrating the impacts that would be occurring. Now that these, now that these impacts are starting to occur, I think there is also starting to be a new question of, well, is it due to climate change, is it due to hydropower projects, to what proportion, is it other reasons besides? So in terms of the kind of politics of knowledge, um, there's going to need to be more focus and more clarity on actually understanding why river conditions are changing and what the impacts are uh, on communities. And I think one important um, disconnect at the moment that needs to be addressed is the, the accountability of the science that's being produced on the impacts to the actual to the communities that are actually experiencing the impacts on the ground. There's a growing number of studies that are kind of looking at a macro level of what the changes are that are occurring without actually connecting it to communities harm experiences due to the changing conditions that uh, Sochita has already outlined in the case of Tonle Sap. A second important um, issue I think is the discourse of sustainable hydropower. To connect this back to COP27 and COP26 and the COPs before, there's been a strong push by the International Hydropower Association to frame hydropower as a climate solution, both in terms of mitigation and in terms of adaptation. Mitigation in terms of claims of carbon uh, emissions reduction, which Pai has already importantly questioned, that there's, especially in tropical context, potentially significant emissions from uh, hydropower reservoirs and uh, a recent study in the Mekong region in 2018 said that really each project has to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. It can't be assumed that uh, hydropower is a significant emissions uh, reducer. But also what we're seeing is that uh, hydropower is being viewed in the context of adaptation. Adaptation meaning that somehow the, well, these projects will manage water flows and in that sense make um, water uh, more regulated as a way of adapting to changing climatic conditions. Um, so there's much to say on both of these topics, but the, I think the, what I would like to flag is um, both for the mitigation, as I've already mentioned, that these are questionable claims, for adaptation, whether we're talking about claims of being able to control extreme weather events, or whether it's actually in the, in the design of current hydropower project operations to manage rivers, in the interest of communities downstream. Both of those, I think, are also dubious claims. Projects are currently being designed and operated according to profit maximization. It's not about managing the river in order to mitigate, uh, sorry, to adapt downstream conditions in the interest of communities. There's also another important debate that connects to this around whether design flows can climate know. adaptation. Uh, so in this case, um, there was an, another, an interesting debate that played out in um, the journals uh, in a not nature as in nature um, that was asking whether the uh, hydropower projects could be operated in a way that would reproduce some of the conditions of the river to allow um, fish uh, fish 
bioproductivity. Um, so again, like this is a kind of politics of knowledge debate where a paper was published that seemed to legitimize the claim that rivers could be managed in this way, but then it elicited a number of um, critical responses on the assumptions of the modeling. So not to go into too much depth on this, I'm happy to answer more questions on it. Um, the point that I want to make is again, that science is making claims that might legitimize forms of business as usual without having a fuller kind of public accountability of what the scientific findings, findings mean for um, the impacts on communities living within the basin. As um, Sachita has already introduced and as the next panel will also address, one of the important discussions to take place or to be that should be taking place in the context of um, the future plans for hydropower should be about um, the need for a just electricity transformation. And that means essentially moving the discussion upstream of sustainable hydropower claims to the entire rationale of selecting large dams in the first place as being the appropriate energy generation solution. And I think um, the next panel is going to unpack this in more uh, detail. What I think is especially important is the what Sachita already raised about thinking about electricity, the purpose of electricity generation, rather than just seeing electricity generation as being an outcome in itself that seems to be integral to achieving development. There needs to be deeper questions about um, what is the energy actually being used for. Um, in the previous panel, there's um, there was some discussion on uh, Lao. And I think you know, when we talk about economic growth and hydropower, uh, one of the interesting questions that I think is also about the quality of the economic growth. Um, actually, the type of economic growth that's being supported by large hydropower is leading to quite concentrated wealth accumulation. So it's not necessarily broad, uh, broadly shared um, income across all of the population of Laos. Um, similarly, for energy generation, we should ask important questions about which like, sectors are using electricity. Is it for quite concentrated um, gain amongst a smaller number of companies and individual, or is it meeting a wider basis of meeting basic needs? So problematizing more the construction of electricity demand, I think is a very important part of this discussion on electricity transformation. And lastly, I think it's important to critically think about the future of the Mekong River itself. Um, I think a lot of the current ways in which knowledge production is being produced in business as usual doesn't really critically engage with what the future might be. Um, so so uh, Ajahn May has already introduced, for example, the possibility of, le of rivers having legal standings. And I, I know that Pai is also working on this quite a lot. There's a growing discussion around whether rivers might have legal rights in Southeast Asia, similar to discussions that, or similar to actual actions that have taken place in countries like New Zealand. Um, we've recently launched uh, this Chulong Kwan University UNESCO Chair in Resource Governance and Futures Literacy, where one of the important questions we want to ask is how to re-problematize the thinking about the future, to um, bring into play discussions about unconsidered futures at present. So Ajahn May mentioned about multiple water worlds, for example, how do we take that seriously in thinking about different futures of the Mekong River? So let me just go to th uh, three ways forward. I think one way forward is revitalizing discussions on the commons. And I think one important discussion on revitalizing, revitalizing discussions on the commons is to move beyond thinking about the commons as only being about property relations, but rather seeing the commons as commoning, meaning thinking about the social relations that are produced by sharing a river in relationship to people in being in common around it. The second is I think there needs to be a lot of more emphasis on the accountability of existing uh, hydropower dam impacts. So I've discussed this in the context already of uh, knowledge politics, um, accountability of existing operations, but I think also revisiting studies that have already been conducted in the past that were used to legitimize projects and to see if they actually were accurate in their predictions or if their recommendations have been implemented. I think this is very important in the context of what Pai mentioned about how EIAs are already a very low quality. Uh, and then the third uh, point would be on critical dialogues on the future of the Mekong River, whether we were talking about electricity, assumptions about sustainable hydropower, or moving well beyond those discussions to think about ideas like the rights of rivers. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. Um, 
There are so many interesting facts and questions put on the table for discussions, um, such as um, the meaning of the river. As a Highlander or indigenous people from um, Burma, I have spent like four to five hours for daily use of water. So for me, what is life? But um, like Ajahn May said, um, how would Mekong say when we cut here and there for hydroelectric power and so on and so on? So this is also how um, we put value on the rivers and the water and also about what well, many of us think rivers are common. Um, there are some other elite groups who are thinking river is ours and we can do whatever we want to do. And they are holding the hydro um, diplomacy and also about uh, the conference of local practice, international norms and uh, national sovereignty. For example, like Ajahn Kal has um, bring into attention about Sayaburi Dam's case and about the data sharing. Um, many of us cannot read the data from Stimson and some other um, scientific groups, which is much more difficult for the local people who cannot read and write and calculate. So uh, what do we mean by water? What do, what do we mean by river? And who own the river and the water? For example, in Burma, um, the past four or five years, this is a big question. Who own Irrawaddy? Um, the Hunta or Kachin people or the whole country? And how about Salu and how about Chao Pria? So, uh, okay, shut to the point. Let me um, welcome one or two questions from um, online participants and another one or other one or two questions from the on-site participants. Okay. Now is the time for Q&A. Thanks very much. Um, it's a question mainly for, for Carl, but other, others can come in as well. One of the things I learned from your work, Carl, is the extent to which um, looking at the Lansang Mekong cooperative framework, it was kind of impossible to see it purely as a hydro or water engineering focused institution, despite the fact that it, it looks on the surface to be a challenge to the MRC. Its, uh, its weight came from the fact that actually um, it has much larger geopolitical kinds of ramifications. You know, it, uh, under its charter, it not only deals with water, but also economic development, political security dialogue, people to people dialogue. So it had this, um, this character that it really was a challenge to ASEAN. Um, and 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 its meetings historically often came along with the inking of a lot of other deals, um, and that gave it its power. And I guess asking you for sort of an update on <laughs> on that because I haven't been following it so much over the last couple of years. But my impression is it also became quite powerful in its role in vaccine diplomacy and so, some of the other um, uh, uh, dimensions of of kind of geopolitics that played out in the last couple of years. So, so I suppose, how does it how does it relate? And um, does does the fact that it's broader than water have also the potential for um, for uh, for more progressive opportunities as well? Could you, for example, use the LMC to um, focus on other types of renewables? Could it be a, an avenue for investment in solar energy and so on? Um, and if if not, why not? Thanks. Let me collect two more questions and then I will give the panelists to answer it. Question from online participant. Do we have question? Okay. So an important an important concept was the concept of accountability. And uh, over the past decades, we have seen that those accountability frameworks hasn't necessarily improved. And it's quite, in fact, shocking that almost in 2023, we're still talking about who is accountable, whereas all the consequences for local community has occurred and will continue to occur. So my question is to the panel, is there any uh, insight or is there any uh, silver lining in terms of you know uh, possible accountability framework that would hold state private actors or others more uh, more cautious about you know actions that they would be uh, undertaking related to them current and future 
second question. Um, so as it has been said already uh, uh, by many different uh, uh, participants and panelists, hydropower is a part of economic development. It's a very, very, I mean, it's, it's a pillar, in fact, of economic development. And that's why uh, so many vested interests. Uh, are you hopeful that in the coming decades, let's put it at the decades uh, unit, they will be, uh, as other developing countries in the West have seen it, the decommissioning of some of, uh, uh, of the lesser important hydro dam and possibly also the uh, transformation or customization of some of the existing dams into more, uh, so I'm careful when I'm using that, but let's say more sustainable or environment, environmentally friendly models that could, for example, uh, take into consideration the flow of, uh, you know, the, the, the fishes across the river. And uh, it has been done also in other parts of the world. So could it happen in our region? Thank you. Well, also your question, and then I will keep. Uh, very quickly, the, the, the first question is about compensation. Uh, we talk about accountability. And I think beyond that is it's about, you know, we talk about the meaning and understanding of, 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 of the river in different ways, how these issues, can be solved by money. To what extent, in what way, and in what way they cannot be solved by money. And then we can talk about who should be responsible to, to, to solve it, I think. That's a, that's a very crucial pragmatic question. And second, to follow Sam's question about technology, probably we can discuss more about technology in the next session, but we have new type of infrastructures emerging. Uh, pumping storage facilities. We have floating solar technologies. Are they giving more meanings of the river or are they destroying more meanings of the river? So these are my question. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. So let me invite the panelists. You can pick up any questions and answer. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to respond to a few questions, maybe starting with the last one first about the compensation and who is to take accountability. For the case of the downstream impact of the Lanchang Cascade, it happened for over 25 years. And what's happening now on the, the more impacts on the Sayaburi Dam in the lower basin, I think the way that we've uh, filed a lawsuit at the Thai Administrative Court over the past 12 years and the final verdict was made just a few months ago. At that time, when we filed the lawsuit, uh, the power purchase agreement was just signed without informing public, without informing affected communities. And this lawsuit is uh, supposed to be a preventive lawsuit that the dam is not yet built, but we file a lawsuit against the Thai authority that allowed the power purchase agreement to be signed without proper public consultation and against other uh, laws and regulation in Thailand and in the Mekong region. But at the end, even everybody see the impacts of the Sayabri Dam and that ex exacerbate the existing impacts of Lanshan Cascade. Uh, the final verdict was not uh, in favor of the affected community. And it say that the PPA itself, the power process agreement itself is not harming anyone, but it's the dam that causing impacts, transboundary impact that felt and uh, affected by the rural and communities for the past three years. So that, I think that's actually describe how the governance in the Mekong region looked like. No one is being, no one's to blame, but the crime, happening there. Uh, I this we discussed among ourselves after the verdict and we were we were not hope we were not hopeless at all. We think that this is not just it might be legal for this for today, but it might be legal in the next government. It might be illegal in the next next uh, cascade uh, in the next decades. So I think the even other dams are built and no one is put in jail, no one is to, to be taking responsibility. 
but what is false is false. What is wrong is wrong. So I, we still hope we still hopeful for the future that maybe in the future when the governance is more inclusive, when the governance is more uh, holding everybody together in the in the in the just society, I think yeah that that thing should be happen maybe in the future. And thank you. Then really, yeah. And and the other thing is on the on the. Uh, Hydropower definitely as a part of the economic development for the region for a long time, but it's time to rethink. It's time to reconsider that economic development paradigm. Is it for everyone or is it just for some rich families and some powerful dictators? And last thing to mention about this is that, yeah, it's not technical problem at all. It's about politics. It's political will from those who have this, who have power in their hands. And the like what you said, does the everybody belong to Kashin people or Burmese people as a whole or, Bur or Myanmar as a whole or everybody in the world? So that's the question that I think we need to put for to be reshaped, to be redesigned and to be fully discussed with meaningful manner. Thank you. Um, I would like to say that um, for the question of the commission of dams, actually for the local people, they discuss about it and they would like it to be happened. And I have heard it many times. Then they ask, keep asking, asking about this kind of questions. And um, although we, uh, our research focus on, you know, agricultural um, production, um, how water used to for the agricultural production, the thing is we, when we um go into the field, we we can see many kind of small scale small scale electric um, power plant within the community. So I I don't know whether it might be you know changing something in the um hydro power plant because um I have no idea about it, and you know the question about um political structures um, of struggle is very true. And um, and many kind of, many, our many um, case study that we are, we are um, conducted, they have to use some kind of social innovative, I would say, like bypassing these kind of <laughs> polit political obstacle. And they asked me not to, mentioned it in the uh, final report. And um, the last one is um, when we conduct our research, we keep asking ourselves, do the local does worry about water or they just worried about this kind of, you know, unpredicted futures. And um, this is something that uh, we keep wondering when we conduct our research. And another thing is, um, another part that I would like to make, which might not answer any kind of question. The thing is we witness many kind of uh, future generation within a community. They try to create their own space and um, they have different perspective on water. Um, like um, they would like to make it uh, more greener and create some kind of, um, special economic activities which would um, might help to change the um, phases of rivers in um, in Thailand I don't know thank you um let me just uh, contribute to my thoughts to some of the question um Maybe just to start by saying that most recently I was in Australia screening the films uh, of the journey across the three provinces to a group of uh, key supporters of Oxfam where I work with. And one of the questions that uh, I received was that, okay, now the Iravadi dolphin in on Long Chetil has died, like died last February. Can we put it back? into that area, the do baby dolphin from elsewhere. I think this is really critical um, questions and uh, certainly very hard to imagine putting the Iravadi dolphin 
to a very new territory. And, and I think I just want to reflect on that in response to a question that Mong Natarun has asked about hydropower dam and the decommissioning. I think that um, in other river systems, such as in the US, when they decide to decommission the dams, it means that um, what the dam have done to the river is almost dead, and they have to revitalize the river by decommission the dams. Certainly in the Mekong, I do not hope that we take that long. Uh, we have already discussed that just for a few of the mainstream dams on the river have caused irreversible change, have made specific uh, species in the river disappear. And these species are very particular to the Mekong River systems. And once disappear is very, very hard to replace. So I think the government in the region should see all this cumulative witness of the loss of the species and that it's, it's irre irre irreplaceable. And they should really account for all this um, when they make decision about what is next in the projects. Um, another part that I want to just mention is on uh, compensation, the question around compensation and accountability and the meaning of it. I think based on the experience of working with communities in um, along the Cezanne River, where the one of the tributary dams was built, and it caused displacement and resistance from local indigenous people. They really, their struggle is really taught us about what is the meaning of the river to their ways of life, and that no, no amount of compensation in monetary term could be replaced or compensated to them in a just and fairly manner, because the project developer, the government, do not understand the connection that the people have with the river, their ancestral various sites, the sacred forest, and so on. So how do we place values, um, money value, when we talk about compensation? Instead, we should be talking about when developing a project, conduct pre prior informed consent to see if it is actually the wish of the local people, what is the value of the local people, and whether this is the only option of development scheme or there are other better alternative option to, to develop to extract energy source, for example. I think already, already strong answers. Um... I'll just add briefly, so thanks Sam for reminding us of the recent history of the LMC. Um, yeah, so I think maybe a couple of years ago, there was a lot more discussion about whether, LMC, she said like LMC is kind of competing with the Mekong River Commission, is it going to displace it? Where would the center of decision-making be? Um, to a degree, there's like still that competition, but I think the, ten, the trend over the last couple of years has been for the LMC and the MRC to actually work more closely together and see themselves as two different centers of kind of knowledge production um, and kind of because even the MRC like the at least in the technical sense is more supposed to be kind of generating knowledge to inform political decision making um, so you're right as you said that I mean LMC was also being questioned about whether it's challenging as in maybe that hasn't materialized as strongly as it seemed like it might do although LMC has done you know, hundreds of projects in the region, but you know, so kind of reaching into different aspects of building uh, institutional connections, especially government to government um, within mainland Southeast Asia. Um, I mean, just to kind of give one example, uh, after the low flows that we were discussing um, became a sort of a political issue after it became the strong geopolitical issue between China and the US, um, it led to a new memorandum of understanding between the LMC and MRC to conduct a hydrological model to understand the reasons for low flows and also its intersection with climate change. And I just want to make like two comments on that. First is, I think it actually what it realized, what it made me understand was that LMC, MRC are not too distant, really, in their logics of thinking about the meaning of development. Like they're both kind of underpinned by an idea of some form of ecological modernization. It kind of has a, a shared understanding of the logic of what a water resource would be. Um, and the second comment on it is that, I mean, that modeling is kind of then looking towards hydropower dam cascade management. So on one level, okay, you might argue, well, that's 
a, could be a good thing, more coordination. But on the other hand, it also furthers the whole process of strongly embedding hydropower as being the norm in the basin. Um, and it's kind of efficient, um, it's efficient operation. Um, and then that kind of also moves further along the lines of how um, state and enterprises and hydropower companies from China are still seeking investments in large hydropower dams in mainland Southeast Asia. Um, I think, so on the second, I think the accountability question has been addressed clearly already, but I just want to add a, something a bit more on the knowledge politics dimension of accountability, because this is what I've been thinking about a bit more recently, that it seems to me that there's a, you know, it could connect the questions of loss and damage that were also being taken place in COP27, that, that how is different impacts on people's lives being understood and disaggregated? Like how much of the impact is coming from changing climatic conditions? How much is coming from individual hydropower projects? But so there are efforts, including this kind of LMC, MRC initiative to kind of quantify it. But that type of, those numbers don't translate to the light, the actual impacts on the ground in individual places. So, and I feel increasingly strongly that this type of science is just perpetuating a knowledge, a, a legitimization of business almost the same as before, but just slightly more sustainable, slightly more green. So then the knowledge production actually legitimizes the continuity of the model. So I, I feel that there has to be the shift in perspective in who is this knowledge accountable to? Is it just to the states that are producing the kind of governance regime or leading it as we've been discussing? Or should there be new mechanisms, clear mechanisms of accountability to the impacts to communities on the ground of the knowledge production itself? So I, we've been reading recently in our course, like the idea that you should have community peer review, not just academic peer review of the knowledge being produced. Um, just briefly on the other questions, I know we're almost out of time. The other really interesting question on decommissioning large dams. I, I don't have a crystal ball to give an answer on this. I'm aware of the discussions, but one of the things that I think would have to be looked at carefully is you know, one of the reasons why it wouldn't change is because project developers see these projects as sunk investments. So if a project is to be decommissioned or reoperationalized, the question would really be who's going to pay the cost? Is the company willing to like, receive some form of compensation? And if we go back to the discussion earlier on like the commons and who owns the river, I mean, there's deeper questions of the original claims for enclosure of the river. But I think a kind of a question in the current political economy of water would be, well, who will pay for reoperationalization of a project if electricity generation reduces vis-a-vis -vis some other public interest um, operation of the project. Um, and then lastly, I think Sachita has already really answered clearly on um, can money solve the problem? Like already, it, loss of culture cannot be turned into monetary forms. I just add one extra point on that, which is not just the kind of social justice, but the ecological justice dimension, the, the kind of the loss of the species um, that was mentioned in the presentations. Like money can't really solve those questions either, especially extinctions are essentially forever. But I just want to connect it back. I mean, maybe this is the academic side of me coming across a bit more, but again, like the, the idea that monetary compensation can solve these problems, perpetuates the model of commodifi commodification of the river is fully okay, which kind of legitimizes ultimately the model of water resource management over the multiple water worlds that Ajahn May is describing of diff very different relationships with the river beyond just seeing the water, the river as being an economic resource. So I think we have to kind of really think about these questions very seriously as well, looking forward to different types of futures of the river. Okay, um, thanks a lot. Um, thank you so much for the powers of wisdom you have shared with us, all the panelists. Oh, you still have questions? There's two questions from online that I would like to share. So. Okay, um, let me take these last two questions. Um, the first question is, do you think there is too much um, emphasis by researchers on climate change? Um, and the second question, um, question to the panelists, such as Carl and others have highlighted in the really interesting presentation, significant 
stretch on the Mekong or dam already? The, the impacts are felt already. Are there any possibilities of building and imaging sustainable river futures with the dams? What might that take and look like? Um, the first question on the climate change. Um, I mean, there are a growing number of of scientific studies that try and connect climate change to also. I mean, that more more of those studies are probably needed because they're, they're taking place in the context of incomplete um, data. But I think what I'd probably emphasize on this is is not just the modeling, but more how that connects to the reality of people's lives on the river. Not, not just the science itself. The science has to be accountable. Um, and then whether what whether that what the futures might be with some projects remaining on the river. Um, I think it, I mean when we think about different futures, then we have to be quite open to the possibility of a whole range of futures, some of which may include them, some of which may not. Um, I mean, there are various studies that have argued that some projects are more destructive than others. So maybe that's the starting point of a discussion to kind of say, well, which projects are causing the greatest harm and let's discuss the future of those first. Um, but really, the I probably concluded on my point, it's not really my question to answer this. There's a lot of people who live within the river basin who should be being asked these questions. Thank you so much. So um, it's already three, so I'm sorry we have to and the panel here. Thank you so much to everyone for your active participation. Thank you. We will take a 10 minute coffee break and then we'll convene for the final session.
He is also a frequent guest speaker on energy efficiency, renewable energy, climate change policy, and energy transition. Um, Dr. Charlie, Mr. Natarun, and Kun Atit, uh, each of you will have 20 minutes presentation. So please keep your time. I will give you um, some time signal only if it is necessary. And following our public seminar agenda, our, our presentation will start with um, Dr. Charlie, then Mr. Natarun, and then Kun Atit. So after all of the presentation, we will open for a Q&A session. So um, please welcome uh, Dr. Sally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, can I have the slide clicker? <laughs> Work to me, huh? Okay. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be here in these sessions. Okay. Uh, as I as mentioned, I was in the area of electrical engineering, uh, the power design and the energy development plan. Uh, our team has been working quite a lot on the design of Thailand future decarbonization plan, uh, which uh, in this presentation, I like to capture some of the uh, presentation that we have made earlier and briefly explain about the result of the uh, decarbonization plan that we have made. At first, uh, I like to bring you to the big picture of Thailand electricity generations. Uh, currently, we are uh, about um, 50,000 megawatt of uh, capacity, electricity generation capacity. Uh, and this seems quite a big number when you compare with the peak power consumption of Thailand, uh, which is only about 33,000 megawatt uh, currently. And that means we have more than 50% of the capacity reserve as a reserve margin. And this 50% reserve margin seem to be quite good in terms of energy uh, stability, but in the same time is also create the problem of uh, expensive uh, or, or over investment uh, electricity in Thailand. So as a result, uh, we, we have to kind of do uh, solving two problems at the same time. Number one, reducing the reserve margin so that you would have uh, not too high cost on electricity generation. Number two, the overcapacity that we have are all fossil power. And as a result, it will create quite a large amount of carbon footprint. Okay. Last year, Thailand used about uh, 195 gigawatt hour of electricity and is expected to grow uh, more than over uh, 50% in the next 20 years. Okay? And therefore, as a result, uh, the growth rate of 1.3% is, ex is expected. Only around 18%, most of which are hydropower, are uh, electricity that generated from the uh, renewable uh, resources. As in terms of uh, greenhouse gas uh, target of Thailand, uh, from the recent uh, number, Thailand has uh, currently generated about uh, 342 uh, me million tons of CO2 per year. Okay, and this number will grow uh, quite quickly. Okay, so by the year uh, 2000, okay, so this number could grow to uh, 2030, could go to 355 or 54. Okay, and we are expected to reduce. Uh, 20 to 40 percent of greenhouse gas emissions okay, by that time. Uh, with this number, okay, so it's quite a big challenge uh, for Thailand in order to reduce our CO2 uh, to be zero, uh, net zero in 2050 and uh, 20 to 40 percent by the year 2030. So with the plan of, with the goal so ambitious, okay, what do Thailand do? Okay? You see that uh, currently, this is a slide from ECAT, okay, the Electricity Generation Authority of Thailand. They are planning uh, perhaps, number one, trying to grow more forests and trees, a uh, million dry of trees, okay, so that is about uh, 400,000 400, uh, acre okay, uh, of forest, okay, and also they plan on the uh, hydro, 
uh, solar panel, okay, hybrid uh, with the solar uh, store, uh, hydro storage. Uh, they also plan to use the carbon capture uh, storage uh, system okay, to capture the CO2 and use the hydrogen fuel okay, so to replace the fossil fuel okay, so that it will reduce uh, the amount of CO2. But with all of this uh, technology and the plan, okay, there was no number uh, that will guarantee or even in the within, near the vicinity of the net zero uh, carbon by the year 2050. So what, what are we doing in our research team? Okay? Number one, we study and trying to find okay, the power development plan that we call the green power development plan, okay? And in fact, is the people versions. So that's mean uh, we are not uh, financed or sponsored by the government. Uh, we do this work on our own and we get some finance support uh, from several uh, organizations, okay? Thailand decarbonization plan is therefore uh, studied uh, by our team, okay? Uh, this is the research team that we are working with. Okay, so leading by uh, Dr. Shalo Thorn, uh, he is from Thammasat University, and myself, okay, Thammasat University, as well Kun Chin Chom, Professor Matthias from Hawaii University, and other researchers. So, in in this objective of the study, number one, we plan to uh, we try to study and synthesize uh, the lesson learned from the past policy of uh, planning. Uh, power development plan of Thailand. Okay? We try to find the, uh, the uh, drawback or the uh, inconsistency okay, in the past PDP plan of Thailand. Number two, we try to propose a framework for improving the uh, planning process okay, of the power sector. And number three, we like to gather public inputs and promote the public participation of all the stakeholder in the planning. Okay? So our planning is not just uh, by our team opinion, but it must be from many uh, stakeholders. And also we like to create the decarbonization pathway so that Thailand will meet uh, its target okay? uh, for the net zero carbon in 2050. Okay? And we like to provide some relevant policy recommendation uh, in order that the government uh, will have the uh, good decision. Okay. So this is the objective that we uh, gather from the uh, seminar. Okay. So before we make the planning, we have uh, a lot of uh, stakeholders okay, participated uh, in our uh, seminar. Uh, for example, the uh, government organization like ECATS or uh, the uh, ERC or many parties, okay, also the uh, public and private partner, okay, so which they give the opinion on the objective of the new PDP. It's turned out that pe most people concern a lot okay, with fairness and aff affordability of the electricity. Okay. Number two, they want to see the good governance, okay, transparency. And number three, uh, people who participate saying that energy, energy security is also important, reduction of environmental and social impact. Okay? And number five, they like to see that uh, it will meet uh, the long-term climate targets, CO2 footprint okay, emissions. So with the top five okay, uh, objective that we get from the opinions, we use it in order to set the KPI okay, for the PDP. And that's why we call this PDP the people version because it's come from the all group of, uh, of people uh, that are in the, uh, in the uh, stakeholder. Uh, the, the rationale for the decarbonization plan that we, we do okay, is started from uh, studying of the current Thailand power development plan. Okay? The current plan that we are using in Thailand right, right now is 2018 uh, versions. Okay? And with the plan that we have right now, if you follow the plan, the amount of CO2 footprint okay, that will occur will follow the blue graph. Okay? The horizontal line is the year, while the, uh, the amount of CO2 uh, compared to the uh, best year, okay, the, the, the beginning year, is actually increasing. Okay. So, but in the long term, we like to see by the year 2030 to be reduced by 20 to 40%. That seems almost impossible from the current plan. 
healthcare. So as a result, we set the target of the carbon dioxide emissions, okay, so that it will reduce okay, according to the yellow line, the red line, and the green line. Okay, so there are three scenario. Okay, uh, scenario one may be a little bit longer term. Okay, and scenario two, uh, net zero carbon emission at 2050, and scenario three we call rapid decarbonization net zero in the energy sector by 2040. And the, the, the blue one, that is the PDP, current PDP, which is growing, okay? So instead, with the decarbonization plan, reduce the CO2 uh, to zero with, with different years targets, okay? So that create uh, three scenario. Okay? In this three scenario, we use the switch software, okay? So which is a simulator software for modeling uh, the uh, power plan dispatching. Okay? So we dispatch the power plan according to the cost, according to the carbon footprint budget, and according to many, many criteria. Okay? So these are uh, the input files okay? or the input assumption that we put into the program okay? so that it will run the best model that coming out under all the condition uh, or constraint that we put into uh, the, the programming. So from the switch model, I like to switch your attention to the uh, past forecast okay, of the demand. Um, if you look at the graph on the screen, you see the blue bars. Okay? Those blue bars are the actual maximum power uh, usage annually okay, from the past to present. So you see that uh, we have a growth, okay, but not really uh, fast in the past few years. Okay? Maybe it start to take off, okay, but now start to get saturated. Okay? With this kind of, of graph, okay, uh, the other lines, okay, you see a lot of lines over there with the date. Those lines are actually the forecast by the past PDP. The past PDP always overestimate okay, or over uh, estimate that the, the, the energy requirement or the power requirement going to be large number, but the actual one always be the blue one, which is much lower than the estimate by the past PDP. So in this PDP, the green PDP version, we have to also estimate the demand. To estimate the demand and do not make the same mistake over forecast leading to over investment leading to expensive uh, electricity. So what we did was that we tried to divide the demand into several parts. Uh, the first part from the captive power or the power that generated by uh, the user by themselves uh, without passing through the public uh, meter. Okay? So that's why it's the, the power that generated by the industry and used inside their own plant. Okay? So we estimate that amount. Okay? We also estimate the uh, power requirement or power demand that will come from the increasing number of EV cars uh, in the future. And from, from all of this factor, okay, so our energy forecast and uh, power forecast okay, has come out to be these two graphs. Okay? You see that the graph that we get okay, is kind of like uh, 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 not really exponential not even linear, okay? And it's kind of plateauing or flattened out uh, at the end, okay? Uh, which is uh, corresponding with the actual demand that we have seen the trend uh, in the uh, previous page, okay? So we think that this load forecast is actually make more sense and it, it will be very close to the real demand uh, in, the, in, the few, in the next few years, okay? After we get the load forecast, we then dispatch all the electricity plant okay, that we have uh, in the candidate. And the result of the simulation uh, was shown to be like this one. Okay? In the year 2022, you see that most of the energy that we have are from the uh, fossil fuel. Okay? And the yellow ones, uh, which represent the solar power, okay? and the orange one represent the battery. Okay? So, uh, start to be become more significant in the later year. 
in the year 2050, you see the energy mix can almost 90% can actually come from the solar power and the battery. The bio solid, biogas or biomass uh, or wind also important, but not as significant as the battery and sun. Okay? And if you look at the number on the axis, on the Y axis, okay, the amount of power that we need to have is quite large, okay? 200, uh, 200 gigawatt, uh, no, 200 megawatt, okay? Two, no, let me say, uh, 200 megawatt, 200,000 megawatt, okay? uh, which in this case, 200,000 megawatt represent quite a large number because those uh, uh, sun or the solar power have to charge the battery uh, during the daytime so that the battery can run the electricity electricity uh, load at night. Okay? So that's why we need to have quite a large number of solar PV. Okay? And this is the dispatch megawatt by the energy uh, source. Okay? So if you look at 2022, you see almost no yellow color. Okay? And for the year 2030, 40, 50, you see higher and higher ratio of battery and sun. Okay? So in the meantime, you will have to phase out okay? the coal lignite and also the gas power plant, which uh, in here represent as uh, the multiple. Okay? Um, at the end of the study, we have compared okay, all the scenario that we have. Okay? We set uh, S2, okay, the 2050, to be the center case. And we have seen okay, that the cost of electricity will not vary much okay, from negative 2% to positive 6% in that region. Okay? So with three models, uh, all the electricity costs are quite the same. Okay? And you get uh, quite a good amount of uh, CO2 uh, target uh, meet at the end. Okay. In summary here, uh, from the study, we have found out that in the future, we will have more and more dependent on the solar PV, okay? lovely 250 to 300 gigawatt, uh, and also on the rooftop plus the solar farm. And 50 gigawatt of the large scale grid battery, okay? it doesn't have to be battery, it could be the uh, hydro power, uh, the, the uh, hydro pump. Okay? So you could use store, the storage of energy in various form, okay? uh, electricity uh, storage. Um, with this amount or with this scenario, obviously the big important come in. Okay? Uh, if you want to phase out the CO2 okay, uh, or reduce the CO2, number one, you have to phase out coal and fossil. Number two, reduce, uh, reduce use the renewable power and develop the energy storage uh, as, as fast as you can. With all of these three plans, there are still some recommendations okay, like uh, the concern of the electricity, electricity price uh, have to be well managed. The existing fossil fuel uh, power plant has to be managed as well because Thailand has uh, quite a lot of it and we, we do have the contract long term that we need to, to, to kind of handle. And we need to strengthen the grid in order to have high ratio of renewable energy. We also have to explore a new electricity market model to uh, bring in new player in the, uh, in the RE uh, industry to the system. And we need to also campaign the just energy transition. Okay? So in order that uh, people will get ready okay, uh, for the change and transition. Uh, the next step for Thailand, we recommend number one, okay, that uh, the new concern okay, is that uh, we need to perhaps take care of the people that are currently in the fossil industry. Uh, for example, they might have to be reskilled or get ready for the new job requirement. Okay? Number two, the, the, the government might have to collaborate with ed educational institute uh, like university or some other in order to play the important role of uh, human resources development okay? and uh, make the national resource, uh, human resources development plan okay? so that they can supply the budgets and get ready 
uh, to get people ready for the transition. Uh, the last slide, okay, I think uh, it's very important now today that uh, we need to share a lot of uh, knowledge and skill uh, to people okay, so that they will become uh, be ready for the big change that's going to be happening. So that is all of my presentations. Okay? Hopefully, uh, it gives you a lot of insight okay, about Thailand energy. Uh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Shali, for your uh, comprehensive um, presentation. Um, I think you have already mentioned on the, the alternative and green power development plan that Thailand can pursue if we want to have the uh, just energy transition. Um, next, uh, please welcome Mr. Tanarun. Well, I, I, I do have a lot, but I don't have a lot of time. So I will try to be very concise. Um, I don't have many slides. Can uh, where are the slides, please? Thank you. I think. So waiting for uh, the slides to come. My presentation is going to focus uh, less about Cambodia and its current PDP and its current energy mix and uh, what are the plans to kind of uh, move uh, the economy toward a less carbon intensive economy. And rather I will want to focus and have a discussion with the audience here in terms of uh, energy transformation or energy transition that we hear more and more. And I want to kind of uh, stimulate some uh, discussion about, about this and see what people think. So I'll speak about maybe a bit of the vision, a bit of the planning and less about the technology and finance, which would require, yes, uh, some, some additional time. Next slide, please. <laughs> so in energy transition, uh, maybe the most important term is transition and how we define it. If we think about, uh, if we take a global picture, which uh, this slide is, uh, is coming from, it's from the uh, International Energy Agency. Uh, what, uh, could you please uh, put it in a full slide mode, please? Thank you. Thank you. Those are my very poor eyes. Even with four eyes, I cannot read the, the screen over there. <laughs> All right. So if, so if we step back and we think about, and there has been some discussion this morning about that, what is the meaning of uh, energy and what is that for? Because if we just focus on the energy se sector for the purpose of, of producing energy, we all agree, most of us, that it doesn't make sense. So we have to look back into, and that's not on the slide, but we have to look back uh, uh, 18th century and the first industrial revolution. And if we think about it, uh, coal was really the main, the coal extraction that supported basically uh, 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 steam, right? Uh, production and therefore at the beginning of uh, industrialization. Uh, uh, that was maybe what we could talk, what we could mention as the first transition. And then uh, that was end of 18th century. And then if we move on a bit, uh, what happened was uh, oil extraction. So after coal, oil come in the picture that we are around 19th century. And uh, what does uh, uh, oil uh, uh, allow? Oil allow uh, the invention of electricity which allows uh, automatization of tasks and uh, more uh, massive production, right? So that's we are 19th century and that second, let's say, uh, revolution and transition. And then we have the third, uh, which is going to occur in the 20th century, which talk about the computerization and uh, dig digitalization, right? And now we're talking about the fourth industrial revolution, and this is all about AI, technology, cloud systems, uh, uh, that uh, mega, um, uh, metadata, et cetera, et cetera. So what we need to think is that energy is uh, behind all those transformations. That's the first factor. 
And the second factor, as you can see now on the slide, is that we haven't really engaged as, in, as a civilization into transition per se, because we haven't closed one source of energy to move to the other one. And rather, what we're doing is we are more kind of in a layering transition, changing the rate of change of some of the energy sources. And therefore, to me, the interesting question, and that's for debate, is about the, rail, the rate of change and the scale of change toward the decarbonization of the economy which goes through the adoption of more renewable energy, but which also goes through the reduction of uh, carbonized uh, sources of electricity and energy. And this is important to mention. So could you please go to the next slide? So you had, uh, I think it was the demand side on the, on, the, on the first slide. So this is the supply side and you can see a very similar picture, right? So you still have coal uh, for the reason, the economic reason you know. Uh, uh, you have uh, 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 oil and then you have LNG. And this is looking at the trends, right? Uh, nowhere to disappear. And if you look at the next slide, so this is now an ASEAN picture. Um, so this is taken from uh, the energy, the, the, the latest uh, outlook that was released. It's actually uh, some very consistent work. Uh, I encourage all of you to kind of go and take a look at it. And you can see that same kind of uh, division, right, in terms of the sources of energy that is fueling our economic and social development. When I'm saying our is, uh, you know, Cambodia, Thailand, and all the 10 other, I mean, all the other ASEAN countries. And you can see that within all the scenarios, and I'm not going to go into the detail of what's the baseline and everything, that's for another time. But what you can see is that whether we like it or not, coal, sorry, coal, oil, and LNG is still part of our energy mixes. So now, do we have to be fatalistic about it? I don't believe that we have to. And uh, in fact, uh, in order to understand what's the picture for the ASEAN level energy transition, what we need to take a look at is country level, is, is to do country level analysis, such as my colleague from uh, Thailand has done, presenting the PDP and the, and the different measures that the, Thailand, that the government of Thailand has taken. And the same would go for Cambodia. So next slide, please. I'm not going to, I'll, I'll get back to that if you like, maybe a bit later and maybe during the discussion that we'll have all together. And the reason for that is because we have already discussed also some of those points in the previous panel and, uh, and in this morning discussion. And those were really interesting uh, discussion that needs to be pursued. The only point that I'd like to mention is the last, is the two last points. So there is, uh, Often in the energy sector, the assumption that if we develop energy at a national level, everyone will benefit, you know, and that's what you call in economic development, the trickle down effect, you kind of, you know, you kind of work with the better off and, uh, you know, and uh, eventually the most vulnerable and the poor may benefit. So the question is, is that valid for the energy sector? And that's a question, open question that I want to ask to everyone. And is that valid? And how valid is it if you answer yes? Or how not valid is it if you answer no? Depending on each of the country contexts in which we operate. And therefore, the need, and that's uh, uh, um, an acronym, JET, but it's a very important topic. And uh, we started that actually in Cambodia with a few other actors, including Oxfam in the, in the room here. Uh, um, we started to have a discussion at the regional level and we found really this exercise very, very important. Why? Because it was the first time that uh, around the table, many different representatives from civil society, um, many different representatives from civil society got the chance to really talk about the energy gap but also talk about possible solutions that are not only policy solution, but also very practical decentralized energy solution that works, that are financially viable and that are scalable. And it was really good because JET could embed some of the principle that would help everyone define what does just 
mean, right? And you could have a lot of debates depending on the different actors in the room, whether those are the government, whether those are the private sector, et cetera. Those discussions are important. They have to take place. And uh, it was very nice that we started with the civil society because maybe one of the messages going ahead is that there is more room to kind of consult with the beneficiaries, which is not something that is maybe depending on the countries often done enough. I'll get back to that a bit if you're more interested into the work related to JET. Next slide, please. So um, now really sharing with you again in a nutshell already took too much time to talk about uh, the bigger picture uh, of the energy transition. Cambodia um, is actually doing uh, quite well uh, in terms of uh, uh, balancing uh, its share of fossil fuel uh, uh, generated electricity together with uh, the share of renewable energy. So uh, big picture first, Cambodia can uh, provide or generate 70% of its energy needs domestically and the 30 remaining percent are imported energy. Um, within those 30 percent imported energy, uh, the larger share of it, which is about uh, 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 60 percent, is coming from Laos. And actually, uh, uh, as of a few months ago, it was mainly hydropower produced electricity. And then uh, and the remaining percent are coming from uh, Vietnam and then Thailand. Thailand is very much uh, regional focus, is really more capturing uh, the northwestern part of, uh, of Cambodia. So, yeah, so 70% domestically produced, 30% uh, uh, imported. In those 70% domestically produced, uh, so as you can see, 44% uh, is coming from hydropower and 6% from uh, uh, solar, uh, so VRE. And uh, not yet, there's no wind yet produced in uh, Cambodia, but there is about uh, 6.5 plus uh, gigawatts of uh, wind power. So it's small, but it's not anecdotal, right? It's, it's small, but it's not that small. And it's, uh, it, uh, so uh, Cambodia uh, will hopefully in 2023 start tapping in uh, wind, but the real potential is in the solar energy. Today, uh, Cambodia is having about 450 uh, megawatts of solar installed capacity. If you compare that with the potential, which is about four, 5 gigawatts of solar uh, uh, um, radiation that you can directly, di directly tap in, you can see that uh, we still have a lot of room to kind of ramp up our uh, electricity generation from solar. So now the situation is that um, in 2019, there has been a defining event, as we call it, in the energy space in Cambodia. Um, we have very much weather um, uh, dependent uh, electricity. So our electricity is depending a lot of, on, on the rain, as you can see, uh, because of hydropower. And uh, in 2019, what have happened is that you had an expected drop, not only in Cambodia, but in the region. And uh, therefore what it led to was uh, uh, electricity disruption, very rapid, which necessitates uh, the, 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 the utility, the energy utility to contract coal. And so in 2019, Cambodia signed PPAs uh, within Cambodia to uh, add more, uh, 700 more megawatts of uh, coal production, and also uh, entered into signature with Lao to kind of substitute hydropower imports with uh, an coal uh, produced electricity. And you have about 1,400 megawatts of, uh, of, PP, of signed PPA with Lao. So our message is, um, it doesn't have to be this way. Cambodia has already installed a coal uh, generated uh, cap electricity capacity, continue to build, uh, con sorry, continue to generate it. But uh, instead of building new coal, uh, replace it and ramp up. Uh, the, 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 the construction of solar energy. So next slide, please. 
uh, do, I, do I still have time? I'm, I'm happy to kind of, uh, yes, I still have a bit of time. Okay, three more minutes. Okay, so that's less than what I expected. But, uh, <laughs> so maybe um, taking, back, taking a step back and looking at the big picture. So um, Cambodia has uh, adopted what we call the long-term strategy for carbon neutrality, which is uh, uh, aiming at uh, reduced or half uh, all uh, Cambodia's uh, carbon emission by 2050. And here on the graph, you can see that if we go business as usual, the main sector that is going to contribute to uh, a CO2 and GSG emission is going to be uh, the energy sector. And I've been mainly speaking about electricity, but the transportation sector is very important. And actually, Cambodia is also investing in the uh, e-mobility scene, such as uh, Thailand. And uh, it's also looking at uh, and about to adopt uh, energy efficiency policy. Uh, 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 in order to address uh, all the thermal heat uh, 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 issues. So next slide, please. So uh, the, the, the above line is the BAU. And uh, as you can see, uh, hopefully we'll be able to follow the trajectory of the uh, orange line to balance the emission. Next slide, please. So for the time being, uh, the main strategy uh, for Cambodia is therefore to kind of uh, uh, reduce uh, uh, its carbon emission uh, from its energy sector. So uh, most of the reduction are going to come from that uh, increasing adoption of uh, electric vehicles, uh, 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 increasing adoption of uh, the uh, energy efficiency policy, which uh, uh, is going to um, the plan uh, uh, in the power development Power development plan 2040 is a gain of 20% uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, energy, 20% uh, uh, um, of energy consumption reduction. And uh, uh, okay, one minute left. <laughs> and uh, and so okay, I'm not going to go into more details. Next slide, please. There are two important pillars when we're thinking about the future. One is really not to lock in more coal power for Cambodia. And second is to really adopt uh, and uh, renewable energy, uh, renewable energy strategy that would set variable renewable energy targets on a yearly basis in order to uh, meet the 30% uh, renewable energy, variable renewable energy uh, target, uh, a target by uh, 2040, 60% include uh, the hydropower. Next slide, please. And that's, and I will end up there. This is one of the uh, uh, possible uh, share of uh, generated uh, electricity. And as you can see, uh, the new picture here is uh, the introduction of LNG. While LNG for the energy specialists, you know that uh, coal is not the right uh, uh, energy to help balancing the variability of solar and wind, but uh, gas would allow you to do that. So uh, that is, uh, in a nutshell, uh, one of the possible uh, a trajectory that Cambodia can take. And there are actually some possible scenarios and strategy that could lead the country to achieve that. Thank you for your patience and uh, happy to kind of discuss in more detail uh, later on. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Natarin, for your uh, very insightful presentation. Sorry that we have a very limited time but however um what i i think that uh, you have you would and dr shari have mentioned clearly that um thailand and cambodia have facing the same uh situation that we are trying to phasing out fossil fuel power plant but at the same time we are locking in the long-term power purchase agreement and um more work uh, i think that in your presentation, you have uh, shared the same idea as uh, what Thailand hope to see, that is we have a green energy mixed 
to um, for the electricity generation. Um, next, uh, please welcome uh, Kun Atit. Thank you very much for. Okay, Cap. Uh, thank you very much for for inviting me to share the uh, idea about the energy transition. Okay, so actually I'm not prepared a slide, but after heard from these two experts, so I think that I should have something to, to share with you. But but actually this slide is planned for one and a half hours. But I will make it within twenty minutes, right? Okay, okay. I try, babe. I try my best. Okay. So, uh, uh, for for solids, there's some in Thai. Okay. Mm -hmm. So right now we all agree that we in the the low carbon uh economics. Okay, mm -hmm. and we gonna especially in Thailand, we be, we can rely. We heavily rely on export, food industry, textile, and many things. And also, we heavily rely on tourists. So uh, definitely, we cannot avoid uh, low carbon uh, future. Uh, the other thing is, even we, we, we expose 1% of carbon emission for the world, but we are number nine that will get effect from climate change. So uh, we we discussed within the the group of uh, team that that even we release only one percent, but we have to show to the world that we will be the leader to reduce carbon reduction because we need everyone to see that please go ahead with climate change. Please go ahead with low carbon society because even though we are number nine of the country in the world who are going to be in very bad situation first. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, with the government, uh, frankly say that we are we are very much worried. So uh, I just come back from I just came back from. Chiang Mai mm. on the, this weekend have a big uh, workshop with Bank of Thailand. Very lucky that we have the very strong entity like Bank of Thailand jump into the climate change activities in Thailand because they talk about uh, taxonomy, they talk about that that the green bond, green finance, that come, carbon credit that come to Thailand need some uh, regulators to drive and make sure that it's go down to the SME, to the lower level uh, entity that can get the the uh, support. Uh, the the key important point is just last week the governor of Bank of Thailand he invite a lot of reporters. And what he worry is, uh, he 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 talked by himself. He said that the most worry, uh, the most important for Thai country is we what he worry about stupid policy. That is the the very strong message from the governor of the Bank of Thailand. That's that's we know that is coming for election next year, and with this type of election, especially in Thailand, we are gonna hear a lot of stupid policy that will that we be gonna face. So we I'm I'm from the Federation of Thai Industry Renewable Energy Club, and we work a lot. We work together with Kun Chun Chong. Kun Chun Chong. Yes, and. To also we 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 develop the power development plan uh, from the uh, business point of view for the people point of view. That I think we have the same picture that that renewable energy and energy efficiency have to be drive uh, very hard. Mm -hmm. The problem is even the climate change law 
until now we still not get it. Uh, that that we we really have to do. And I think even we have many organization, Thai Greenhouse Gas organization or whatever, is still be under stupid policy. That that is the 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 really big problems. Okay, even we commit to the uh, in UN in the COP twenty six, COP twenty seven, but uh, we really worry that the country policy will do something with uh, with make us cannot meet that target two thousand fifty and two thousand sixty five. Even currently, we are waiting for new national energy plan, the new one. We wait one and a half year already, and it still not come out yet. So there's many things behind. There's many reasons behind. Okay, I will try to jump too fast. Okay, uh, we lucky that we have carbon neutrality, climate change action to help us to drive the good direction of country national energy plan. But anyway, it's not yet come out. Uh, people facing the very high energy tariff. Before this, the government said that the energy price, the high energy price come from, come from renewable energy. But today they are very quiet from that stupid policy that put more than 60% of our electricity generated from natural gas and coal. So uh, uh, we have a lot more to fight. And you can see that uh, uh, the uh, climate in Thailand, majority that come from energy sector and uh, 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 transportation sector that this is the majority of the the problems and from the study that I think this picture is really popular that that uh, study from IEA the energy efficiency is the biggest player that can drive us to meet uh, carbon neutrality by 2050 the second portion is the renewable energy and the less is from other fuel switching or carbon capture. You can hear recently that the government minister of energy tried to talk about carbon capture. The reason behind is they try to move on uh, fossil fuel because they said that it's gonna be gonna have carbon capture in the future or something like that, which which we fighting very hard. Carbon capture is still I and D stage. So currently we have to rely on the current technology, which mainly on renewable energy, solar energy storage, wind, and other things that we can catch it very fast. Okay. And so for energy efficiency is one of the key important factor for Thailand to meet our carbon neutrality target. And we try to give a shout to the government that uh, data lake from the current energy situation, the, the activities about measurement and verification, measurement report and verification, the thing that can drive energy efficiency together with carbon neutrality. So we talk about the digital platform and uh, intelligent uh, data verification, uh, online monitoring that transfer the renewable energy activities and energy efficiency activities to over the platform to the VVB, to greenhouse gas organization, to uh, to generate the carbon reduction certificate. So our activities has to be 
well developed and make sure that uh, we can collect all carbon reduction certificate together with as much as possible activity related to energy efficiency and renewable energy. So this is very important because we can say that carbon reduction certificate is our country asset. And we need that to getting along with our activities on that. And at the end, we are working closely with Bank of Thailand on the financial support, financial instrument, tax instrument to support this EE and IE activities. That's all thing very important to drive our country to meet the climate change or carbon neutrality target. So energy is the, the key, very key factor that we have to be serious on that. And, and we are very confident that, that if we concentrate on energy efficiency plan, that our government never do that because they are afraid that if they plan the energy efficiency for the next 20 years and they cannot meet, we're going to have a big problems. But from our side, we say that you must meet this target even though we cannot be survived. So to put energy efficiency target is the first thing to do before you plan national energy plan. And energy efficiency target is the plan that we, uh, we cannot avoid to success on this target. So we have to think about the, uh, the instrument to measure uh, the success of the, the target. And we think that it's not, uh, we capable to meet this kind of target. We think about next 20 years, we have to meet 35% uh, uh, energy efficiency from the business as usual target. And from this plan, we will use this plan as the baseline to develop renewable energy plan. And also after that, we can think about some kind of small portion of fossil. But this thing never happened in Thailand, but we hope that with the current criteria of carbon reduction uh, that we commit with the uh, UNFCCC or whatever, we cannot avoid to, to do this anymore. This is the example of the stupid policy that we have. Mm -hmm. Okay, we still have net zero. We still have zero export regulation. We import very high price natural gas currently right now, mm -hmm. but we still not. We still have to uh, export the the excess of of solar generation all over the country. So you can see that the blue color is the normal energy, normal demand in, in factories, in the buildings that we cannot avoid whatever we do. When we install solar PV, we cannot avoid the red light go over the blue light because of zero export regulation, because of this stupid regulation. So all over the country, we can say that we, we throw yes. a huge uh, clean energy out and we still import very expensive natural gas yes. until now. So this is one of the big things. We, we gave a shout to the government the whole year last year, every year, that this thing have to be get lit, but it's still there. The problem is of, of this is not only we, we throw these good things away uh, and we have to limit the installation of solar because if you, uh, the, uh, the orange color is the graph that uh, the, big, the bigger size of 
solar installation because it is the economic scale. We can get better IRR. But in Thailand, the bigger size, you get lower IRR because you throw the energy away all the time. So in Thailand, we have to be smart enough to design solar that we have to seek for the optimum point. What if the optimum capacity that we can install for that uh, factory for that building to avoid that, not to throw the power away too much, but we can meet economic scale. This is a point. And then what happened? After this is that buildings, that factory cannot implement energy efficiency measures because if we reduce the, the blue line consumption, we throw more our investment from solar away. So that's why we say stupid policy because we, we uh, birth control both renewable energy and energy efficiency currently. That is the big problem. So Federation of Thai Industry fight very hard to get rid of this thing. You, this is another example of the graph that if for to install solar, if you don't want to throw any uh, the, the investment away, uh, you can install only 500 kilowatt, for example. But uh, to optimize the, the, the sizing, uh, you can less up a little bit to the number two. But if we can apply net billing or net metering, we can double capacity of the installation. So we do nothing. Just only get rid of this stupid policy out. We can immediately increase our renewable energy easily three times immediately. Yeah. And also the other thing that we try to force Thai greenhouse gas organization we need the very, uh, very smart digital platform to make sure that our renewable energy project, energy efficiency project, can be easily apply uh, carbon reduction certificate with the digital platform and and uh, very good application to drive it. But anyway, we, we are still uh, insist on quality of carbon certificate. So, but we think that with this current technology, uh, uh, digital platform technology, it's not too difficult to make it happen, get good quality and easy to get at the same time. Okay, so final is a uh, final conclusion is the uh, we try to get rid of stupid policy. We need artificial intelligent energy regulator. We cannot use energy regulator. We cannot use energy regulator by people. AI is really easy. Uh, and, and we got the question that, that how can you develop that difficult AI uh, to drive the energy policy in Thailand? I said that that's very, very easy equation. You put, do it for the people and do it for the country. And then after that AI will provide the good regulation for our country. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, uh, I, I think that you have a very more than insightful presentation, what I would say is more than, um, it's a kind of off the record presentation. <laughs> and, and I think that more, oh, no, 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 I mean, uh, <laughs> the, the, the center will, will um, I think that they, they, they will consider how much and uh, uh, what will going to be uh, distributed like online. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> okay. I talk like this in every in every <laughs> stage. Every channel, every <laughs> okay. Um, and I, I think that um, three of you have all agreed that we need a very um fast, quick, and um tangible energy transition, not only like something that in the paper or just the what finds in the in the conference room. So energy transition is a must and um, it got to be the just energy transition as well. Um, one other thing that I would like to add on what uh, Kunatit have said is that um, according to my study, like lately I study on the digital platform. And one of the thing is that why digital platform has been growing so fast in every economy. Thailand have around um, 50 billion baht and it's, it is expected to grow up to 100 billion baht within a couple of years. And surprisingly, in the whole economy, in the whole um, data that I have searched, there is no energy sector in the digital platform at all. So which means that in, the, in a couple of years, 100 billion bars wouldn't include the energy sector. And this is a message that I already delivered to the regulator that um, why we are talking about the digitalization, digitization, how come we doesn't exist in the platform economy? And as we know that the platform is up and coming and we are all relying on the platform, even in our education sector so how come what happened with the energy sector which is like a very um uh, energy sector is considered as a leader in the in the economy as a whole apart from being the finished products we are we are acting like a infrastructure for the other sector as well and they are all going digitalized why <laughs> why we are all still on the the what uh, non-digital life or something but anyway um I, I think that um now it's time for the floor if you have any questions or, and comments for the panelists please um please uh introduce yourself or at least we know each other okay Please. Hi, um, Sam Gill from China Dialogue. Um, I have some sort of bigger thoughts about just transition song, but I'll leave them to the end when I might have a chance for concluding remarks. I just had one quick question, which was looking at the at the first at the scenario in the first presentation, and then thinking about the remarks in the last presentation about the um, absurdity of importing high price gas and exporting solar energy. I was struck by how little storage is seen in those in, in those scenarios. Right. It takes like 15 years before there's any real ramping up of storage. So what's the what's the constraint there? Is that about economics? Is that technical? Is that political about energy market reform? I, I'm I'm not a specialist, and I, but but it just struck me as, as an obvious yeah. problem with those scenarios. Uh, of all the plans that we have seen, you see that uh, the role of energy storage become increasingly increasingly important over the year, and um, you you may say that uh, energy storage uh, is still in the competing uh, which technology on competition which technology gonna emerge as the big scale energy storage. Uh, the the energy storage that we believe right now is commercializable is the hydro power hydro storage. Okay? So where you store a lot of uh, water in the top area and then pump back okay? uh, whenever you need the electricity. So that that I think is uh, number one that Thailand or every country that want to build the storage at current time should be focusing on. And as time passed by, okay, so you see that more and more grid uh, scale energy storage like battery become available. And ob obviously uh, lithium battery will not be the choice okay, because it's, uh, it's too expensive for grid storage and it's also uh, overkill uh, for being the grid storage. Okay? It might be used for the place where you need 
uh, lightweight, compact, and then small size, uh, like in in EV cars. Okay? Um, it it is true that it will take a long time, but I don't think it will be that long, like 15 years. Okay? I, I expect that it will be much faster, like in the case of Australia, okay, where they built uh, a large grid storage, like in the order of 1000 megawatts in only uh, five or six year times. So I, I guess that Thailand, once we run out of all the cheap uh, storage and we start to build on the battery grid, then we will be able to do similar to what Australian did. Yeah, yes. Yes, may I add a little bit. Uh, it's going to be step by step. We think that we believe that uh, uh, due to the currently projection of electricity tariff in Thailand, next mm -hmm. year is maybe almost six baht. Increase something like that. Yes. Feasible. So one, uh, one of the very, very strong. Uh, support that the government provide is the BOI. Mm -hmm. We have the special energy efficiency BOI and we can claim up to 50% of the investment mm -hmm. uh, from the uh, 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 tax re reduction, mm -hmm. tax we claim. So with that, with that uh, and, and also I think right now we have the good scheme on the uh, import duties and excise tax on the energy, uh, on the Battery. So with these two things, BOI and uh, and electricity tariff go up. So we hope that by maybe the end of next year, uh, the energy storage will come more and more. Uh, unfortunately, actually, from the projection of the price, it should come out this year. It should be at the good point by this year. But due to the Ukraine uh -huh. problems. And the the rare earth problems, mm -hmm. so the lithium price not go down like we expect. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I think we need within a few years, maybe next year or the, the next the after next year, we will not throw the clean energy away anymore. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Okay. Uh Sorry, my name is Joydeep Gupta. I'm a journalist from the third poll. So uh, one point of clarification and one question. Uh, so when you talk about hydropower as storage, are you basically talking about pumped hydro or? Yeah, okay. So not new dam, not new dams, all pumped hydro. Okay, so that brings me to the question. You are talking about just energy transition. Now we have just had two just energy transition plans for South Africa and Indonesia go through. There are others in the pipeline, including India is being considered. Uh, so in both South Africa and Indonesia, there is already a lot of worry and disquiet because well over 70% of the money is loan. And well over 60% of those loans are at commercial rates. Uh, so there is a lot of worry in both countries about getting into a debt trap because of taking this money for just energy transition. Have you considered it? Has Thailand considered that? If you take money, are you willing to take it in commercial rates of interest? Uh Ah, okay, maybe I can uh, give some point uh, regarding the loans and the interest rate. Um, the reason that in the last slide, a few slides of my presentation mentioned was that uh, Thailand need to perhaps study about the new energy market model. Uh, right now, Thailand use the enhanced single buyer system where the government uh, guarantee uh, the profit of the uh, investor who invests in the electricity power plant in Thailand, they're going to get a fixed amount of return, no matter what happening. So all the risks are taken by the government, uh, which in the future, I think this is not really a fair uh, kind of uh, competition. Okay? And as a result, Thailand may need to have uh, some of the risks distribute back uh, to the investor so that uh, the amount of power plant in Thailand was not built 
uh, freely or without any kind of concern that they're going to get lost. Um, so if we distribute the, the risks back to the private company, they're going to be the one who have to take care of the loan and make sure that the loan they get is competitive enough so that the return on investment is still uh, is still on the way that they expected. Okay? So uh, by, by changing this scheme, I think the problem of interest or risks in terms of government risks will be reduced. Yes. I add a little bit, Dan. <laughs> Actually, it's not the government risk. Mm. It's the people risk. Yes. Because uh, whatever government yeah. that uh, increase the electricity tariff is go and result to the people. Mm. So in Thailand, we can say that we are the heaven of energy investor because our regulation protected to the energy investor. I'm okay with the past 20 years that we try to protect energy investor to let them come to Thailand to build up, to build the growth of our economics, but not now. Until now, it still be that heaven. And uh, a few people, 10 people, still in that heaven. But other 70 million people are the other side <laughs> of the world. Yeah. Please come. Thinking about 10. And then Kun Supergit. My name is Carl Middleton with Center for Social Development Studies here. Um, actually, the, the, my question quite follows along from this idea of a small number of people being in heaven. And especially, I think, so for the first presentation by Dr. Charlie, you presented a picture of a pathway forwards to a decarbonized um, energy sector. But there's also a kind of, I would imagine a fairly strong resistance from business as usual um, that benefit from the current way of generating electricity and the profits that are made. So I wonder if you have any arguments in favor, even towards those types of companies about why a transition would take place. How would you appeal to their interests? Um, maybe this is a question for Konatit as well. And then I also have a, a second question for uh, Mr. Natoron, which I, mean, I really enjoyed the, the philosophical aspects of your presentation as well. But I want to, I think Sam will maybe comment on it a bit later. So I have a question about, I remember reading one paper a while ago about the possibility of what is framed as hard slog or leapfrog. So there's kind of these promises that are a country that has not heavily invested yet in, in um, energy systems might just leap ahead and learn from other countries of the mistakes that have been made in the past. But does that happen or not? Like there's kind of a lot of questions about, well, leapfrogging implies the possibility of accessing new technologies and accessing the, pos the new like, ideas and knowledge that are required around a different type of energy system. So the question I wanted to ask was, is it possible to have a leapfrog in the case of Cambodia to kind of skip an earlier way of energy, an earlier form of energy system? What are the choices that are available to the Cambodian kind of energy decision makers? Like, is it really on the table that they're making a choice between a totally new energy system or business as usual? If not, if, if, if the choices are quite constrained, what types of support are actually needed in order to make a leapfrog instead of continuing the business as usual model. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you for uh, the question. Um, so first of all, in terms of leapfrogging, it can, it could mean two, two there are two scenarios. One, uh, in the case of the tele telecommunication sector, Cambodia kind of, uh, in that case, leapfrog, you know, from like a, a, a landline to, uh, you know, the, the, the wireless, uh, wireless phone. So in the case of energy, the leapfrogging may be in terms of the efficiency of the policies that are being implemented. So I was quite interested because we have a similar situation in Cambodia with the, for example, uh, a policy that regulates solar rooftop, which prevents today uh, the carbon sector, one of the um, uh, uh, driver of growth. There are four sectors in Cambodia, garment is one. And uh, today the regulation are a penalty. 
if uh, you are a, a garment manufacturer and you want to put solar on your rooftop, the price of electricity that you generate is higher than the one you get from the grid. I will not go into the detail. There are many different reasons. One is because of the uh, capacity charge. But uh, um, so Cambodia can learn from Vietnam, for example. And uh, what can Cambodia learn from Vietnam? Vietnam has uh, uh, increased uh, uh, very rapidly its uh, solar uh, uh, um, uh, generation uh, into the grid. To, to the extent where uh, they really increase rapidly their uh, install capacity, their generation capacity, but the grid couldn't take it anymore. And all of a sudden, uh, 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 the Vietnamese government is, is just stuck with all those investments. And, uh, and because they realize that coal is not the appropriate uh, uh, energy to balance uh, the variability, right, on the grid. So Cambodia can learn from that. And that's why, uh, um, what I was sharing is that if we prepare from today, and if we gradually kind of uh, build those production capacity, rather than waiting till 2030, like it is the plan on the PDP, then that would be some type of leapfrogging in the sense that why, why should you wait uh, 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 also, you have sufficient capacities within your existing uh, installed uh, energy capacity to produce electricity for your consumer, right? And also what is very interesting is that in any power development plan, the plan is a plan, it can get revised. And it's very important to understand that the energy sector is evolving so fast. Just look at, for example, the price of, uh, a raw material like the price of coal, how it has skyrocketed with the Ukraine crisis. So this kind of changed the ball game because today uh, uh, financing of coal projects is very difficult, and therefore also there is a commitment because of the PPA that I signed. In reality, it's going to be difficult to see those projects come to light. So what are the possible options, and how are the countries are doing that? Right. So there is still room. And, and same for the price of uh, lithium batteries or for the price of uh, 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 a PV uh, um, solar PV. All this is rapidly evolving as well. As we speak, technology is making leaps. There has been from the COP27, uh, a signature uh, among all the big uh, renewable energy and industry association that are going to cooperate, right? To put knowledge and research in common. So maybe what we will see is an acceleration of progress and technology efficiency. So yes, Cambodia can and will hopefully learn from uh, all, all those uh, different examples. And the same, and I will, I will stop there, in the e-mobility, on the e-mobility scene, what Cambodia is doing is learning from, for example, Thailand. And uh, we hold, uh, uh, not that long ago, um, a seminar on uh, the EAC, Energy Attribute Certificates, Thailand has already adopted IREC. Cambodia hasn't done that yet. So instead of kind of piloting in the vacuum, you know, a, a new scheme without understanding how it's being done, then we're looking at Thailand, we're looking at other countries, Indonesia, Vietnam, et cetera, et cetera. And the same thing goes with uh, e-mobility. Right now in Cambodia, we have like what? We have, uh, let's say about five charging stations, five. Thailand, you are what? Or, uh, uh, Several, several hundred already, exactly. So how does Thailand uh, do it? You know, how, how do you kind of plan for the increasing uh, demand that the, uh, the, the, the EV or the e-mobility sector is going to bring onto the grid, right? How do you also plan for forecasting systems, right? That is going to uh, uh, allow you to uh, adopt more uh, renewable energy. So all this and those forecasting system is another also example. We can learn and we should learn from uh, other neighboring countries. Thank you. So Maybe I answer the question that Klaus asked about. Okay? Um, it's, it's true that uh, the fossil industry gonna uh, try to prevent uh, the transition from occurring because they get the direct effect from that. Uh, despite that, and, and they also have a, a, 
an influence on the in the, on, on the government uh, level and the decision making level. So despite all that, I, I, I think we still have some light at the end of the tunnels. Uh, for example, number one, if you look around the world, uh, the trend of the climate change and the uh, concern over the carbon footprint are now cannot be avoided. And Thailand, as part of the global community, the government must somehow try to follow that. And with our energy transition, I don't see any other pathway to reach uh, the zero carbon, uh, net zero carbon uh, in 2050. Uh, that is when you look at the world. Number two, when you look at civil society in Thailand, more and more people start to aware and more and more people are start to get movement to, to, to let the public aware of what's happening in the electricity generation uh, behind the scene. And people start to also help themselves okay, by installing uh, solar PV on their rooftop. Uh, you will see that more and more industry and uh, other, uh, maybe even the 7-Eleven uh, convenience store start to install uh, solar PV on their own. So you cannot stop the movement like that easily. Okay? The transition is going to come no matter what happens. And third, okay, uh, the, the politicians come from people elections. And Thailand election is coming very soon. Uh, in next year, next few months, okay, we're going to have the general elections. And I believe this time during the election, the electricity or energy policy will be one of the big question that people are gonna ask about uh, when they want to choose which number they're gonna, they're gonna choose. Okay? So uh, that will be the point uh, that is happening in the near term. Um, last one, um, when you look at the fossil company, big fossil company in Thailand, they have a move or a bet in the renewable energy sector as well. So that's mean even themselves, they, they do not, so sure that the fossil fuel is going to last very long. So I think uh, is all, all the factor that I mentioned, the transition will occur, but in at different level, depending on our effort. Yes. Last one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, as I mentioned that, that uh, so we have, many questions in many years before that, that why it cannot be changed. And, and after we go deeper and deeper, uh, we, we think that, uh, that's why I talk about that we need artificial intelligence, <laughs> energy regulators. <laughs> that's my- Oh, um, you will be the last one. Okay. <laughs> So thank you very much for the really interesting panel. And actually my main question is because of the composition of this, of this uh, panel. So I am Supakit Nantawarakan from uh, Tala Climate Foundation. Uh, actually I got only one main question, but, uh, uh, but I can link to uh, briefly to some issue that just asked. So I start with uh, the question about money first. From my own perspective, Thailand energy sector actually do not lack of money. <laughs> we pay a lot of money every single day, every single year. It's just that we pay to guarantee the really high profit of the investor of large power plant. We pay for too many power plants that has bill and we do not and do not generate electricity and we still pay. Apart from that, we have a lot of funds. We have the energy conservation fund, 200 million US dollar every single year. And where are those money going to is uh, also add to this that we Thailand energy sector, we do not. Apart from Incon Fund, we have the other fund, uh, Electricity Development Fund under the regulator, not 200 million, but I guess something like 100 million, uh, 
50 million US dollar every single year. So really a lot. But second, I can make small joke about the energy regulators in Thailand that they are not uh, fully independent. The regulator in Thailand is semi-independent. So they can do something, but under the policy of Minister of Energy. So that link to many issues that, that the, the speaker mentioned. So my main question is actually now we are facing the crisis of fossil fuel price, really expensive. So actually this should make economic case for renewable energy and energy efficiency even better. I mean, it already better even before the, the Ukraine-Russian war. But now it should be even better and we should not waste the crisis. So my main question is that, how can we work better together considering that we have the private sector, academic and civil society? How can we work better to make use of this crisis and for the transition to make it just uh -huh, how, especially I would love to hear from the private sector because now I, I personally heard a lot about academic and civil society, but also feel free to add, but really would like to hear the, the, the perspective from private sector. How can we work better together to address this challenge? Really, really hard. It lasts for 20 years already, but hope we have a better idea. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kutsu Bukit. Actually, he's, he's the one who invited me for this panel. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, we really have a good hope before this, uh, that, that with climate change, with many uh, activities that we need to get rid uh, of uh, fossil fuel due to the price, due to opportunity on carbon reduction. So we, we, we put a huge power to work hard uh, because the opportunity come and, and we think that we're going to win because fossil fuel very high price, renewable energy very low price, and no more announcement from, from government that, uh, that renewable energy is expensive. Before this, regulator talk in the uh, announced many times that we, uh, the renewable energy is very high price, so that's why we have to plan like this. And they quiet for about a year. But you know, this morning I just have a, a bad dream again, because the the director general, Palat Kasuang, permanent secretary of Ministry of Energy, he just announced that really really hurt. He just announced that uh, he gonna build the green transmission system special green transmission system to deliver the green e electricity to the end user that require green electricity, special uh, with physical spe as a special dedicated transmission system. And the one who like to get the green electricity, you need to pay high price. What they think. So I said, oh, you come again with the. Actually, I'm not. I should not use stupid policy. I should should use very smart policy for only ten people in the country. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, to conclude what we have discussed, I cannot conclude because I think that you all have concluded in. You are my already that we are going to have a long way for our just energy transition. And um, then I would like to thank you all for your active participation. And I may also express any my particular thanks to our panelists for their time and their constructive discussion. Let us, let us give them a big hand. Thank you very much. 
Thank you also to Ajahn Buri for facilitating this session, a very interesting session. We're almost at the end now of a very long day. Um, thank you so much uh, for wrapping us up with a really uh, interesting final panel. Um, we have in the agenda a couple of closing remarks from the organizers. We'll, we should keep this very brief, I think. Um, I'll, so maybe first I'll, I'll hand over to Sam from China Dial to give a couple of uh, final thoughts. Thank you so much. Um, and yet, I'll just start by thanking you, Carl, for hosting and for all your work in, in, in helping to organize this. It's been fantastic at short notice, and I'm really happy to be back here. Um, for, um, and, and also to, to Superkid, who, who, who also, also played a role. Um, just for, for background, for context, um, China Dialogue was founded in 2006. Um, when we first started, uh, we were aware that China was widely used as an excuse for inaction in the West. People would say, why do anything about climate change if China's opening have many coal-fired power stations a week? Um, in China, there was a growing public awareness around environment and climate change issues, but a sensitivity around engaging with international partners, because it was seen that this would be somewhere where the West would try to dictate the terms of China's development. And we saw that there was something more constructive to be found in working together so bilingually um, and now multilingually uh, to find a common shared understanding around accurate information so that you could sort of move forward with more constructive dialogues. Um, but, you know, on reflection, that was a much more geopolitically optimistic era in terms of the way that um, China, the West, and, and the rest of the world could kind of uh, work together. And I think embedded in it, to, to, to riff on something that uh, Carl said earlier, I think there was a shared kind of understanding, perhaps, that or a shared kind of um, imagination of a kind of ecological modernization agenda that we were all going to kind of settle around. And I think today we're in a, a much less geopolitically optimistic time and also much more uncertain one in, in, in lots of quite important ways. I think this, there is still a common challenge, clearly. There's still a common challenge around, uh, around reducing the carbon in the atmosphere, around doing that in a way that is consonant with um, uh, achieving that in a socially just fashion um, and preserving the, the, the natural world or some kind of ecological integrity at the same time. Um, but the, the ways to get there are going to be far more multilateral, far, far more complex and take place in an era marked by increasing conflict, increasing crisis, war, inflation, pandemic, um, a number of other elements. But also to sort of play off some of the conversations we've been having, that increased uncertainty also creates uh, an increased possibility for more progressive and liberatory futures, you know, um, to indulge for, for a second a more academic kind of strain of my, my background, I'm always drawn on and think back to, to a line from the geographer Doreen Massey, who drawing on the cloud, um, said that, you know, only if the future is open, is there any ground for politics that can make a difference? So in those moments of uncertainty, you can actually start to really think beyond some of the more conventional kind of cost benefit analysis, some of the more conventional trade offs, some of the more conventional kind of economic thinking, and actually redraw the sorts of uh, futures that you might imagine. Um, regionally, globally, in terms of what you mean when you talk about not just transition, but transformation. And, and I think that's what we've been sort of trying to get at today. And I think different people have approached this in different ways, but I really appreciate that there is this sort of openness to, to thinking about what the future could look like. And to sort of end on, uh, I think two optimistic visions that I've encountered in the last couple of uh, months that um, haven't been discussed, but I think are maybe, maybe relevant. Um, one uh, came from uh, from conversations over the last few months I've been having with with Latin American partners around the um, uh, the Escazú Agreement, which was a, it's a UN convention around um, that's been signed in in Latin American Caribbean countries, um, named after a place in Costa Rica where it was signed, um, which is around enshrining environmental rights. Uh, in, enshrining public uh, human rights uh, to decision making in environmental affairs, specifically through three dimensions, public participation, open information and access to justice. And I think that as a framework around sort of procedural rights that start to include things like early, um, early and full public participation, um, 
uh, environmental impact assessments, thinking about transparency, whistleblower protection, environment, the protection for the rights of environmental defenders, um, having um, uh, standing for NGOs in, um, in, in legal cases, uh, needing a competent judiciary. These sorts of these sorts of rights, I think, at least point to a particular kinds of way that you could think about having greater rights for publics in, embedded in environmental decision making. And in, in Latin America, I think there's been a really interesting kind of bright spot in recent years. Um, and it's come up in other conversations, um, particularly in the African continent, in, in, uh, in some work I've been doing recently. And I, I find it quite, um, quite exciting in terms of pointing towards more bottom up uh, structures that could be empowering for creating new kind of environmental frameworks for decision making. And then the other thing that 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 occurred to me also was an example from from East Africa, which um, resonated in the conversation around around leapfrogging and also links to, to some of the work that, that I've done in the past with with Wei Shen, which is around some of the uh, really interesting kind of models that can come up under the radar from from grassroots experimentation in East Africa in recent years, pretty much under the radar without any real um, state support or development cooperation support. Um, there's been a, a expansion to now pretty ubiquitous uh, usage of small solar home systems and microgrids um, using uh, using batteries plus uh, plus solar PV technology that has really only been able to be widely commercialized because of the falling cost of, of solar PV modules thanks to the large scale of production in China. And this joined up with mobile payment systems um, has actually really transformed the landscape of uh, of renewable energy for the poorest people um, and brought the, the benefits of, of electricity access uh, in a way that's you know pro-development, pro-poor and, and, and really sort of showing the way for a lot of places but actually really out of grassroots innovation. So just to point to two things I think that, that say something about where you might find inspiration from kind of grassroots and more uh, a more bottom-up progress um, that hopefully could be harnessed and, and brought back into these bigger imaginaries about what the region could look like uh, in future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sam. Some inspiring words. Uh, thank you. So, from the on behalf of the CSDS and the Faculty of Political Science, um, I'd also like to thank uh, Sam and Tyler Chain and Dialogue for uh, helping us to pull this together, and also for Superkit for inspiring us to make this happen as well. Um, I think my CSDS team, Kiri just behind, and um, Oropan outside, um, who have been working behind the scenes to kind of make the event happen and also our students here for keeping the show on the road uh, over the day. So thank you for all of you. Um, I don't know how to summarize it either, like beyond just summarizing a panel like a whole day, but it's been, I feel quite, it's been a journey. I mean, the, the ambition I was really keen on when we pulled this, the idea to get to have this um, event to just talk like forward looking towards, towards a green and just energy, uh, sorry, a green and just recovery and kind of these th these big themes, but really important themes of climate futures, sustainable transformations, and the role of China. Um, and it seemed important, and I feel that we've achieved over the day um, to kind of cover the, dis the different dimensions of the discussions in different ways. And I, I think it's been really important that we brought together journalists, civil society, academics, private sector as well to see this as a as a multifaceted discussion to take place and. Not to, I'm not going to try and summarize, but just to point out that over the course of the day, we've covered technologies, finance, economy to political economy, political ecology to the politics of knowledge, and then also to the ethics and norms that are kind of underpinning all of this as well. Um, one, I had one surprise actually. I, I thought that the idea of Anthropocene would come up. So I thought I'd kind of briefly bring um, this into the discussion as a final thought, because to me, like one of the big, like the fund fundamental recognitions now that is like within academia, but I think also within more popular discourse is the recognition of these like so-called Anthropocene. Like, and that the meaning of that word is that humans are acting at such a scale that we are changing at the global scale, our, our world, our habitats. And, and it's, and very importantly, in turn, that acts back onto human society as well. It's not a one way, it's not a one-way track. I think as this final panel has demonstrated, one reason why Thailand might want to demonstrate leadership in decarbonization transition is because of the risk or the, not even the risk actually, the realities already that climate change is having onto the country and onto people in, inside Thailand. And so that kind of interaction I think is crucial to think 
about just transitions looking forward. Um, and I think it really requires like new ways of thinking. So we've, we, we have touched on this in quite in detail. Um, I think Wei Shen at the beginning of the afternoon made a very impassioned point about the need to think about the dominant economic system or model and its kind of purpose and you know, raised a really important challenge about how does transition take place? And that came into this panel as well, specifically for energy. Um, over the course of the day, we've talked about other entry points, so food systems, uh, rivers and the relationships between people and water, climate, energy, and, and others beside. Um, and I think if I wanted to connect that to the Anthropocene, then what we really also are talking about, we're not seeing these as sectors, but we're kind of seeing these as nature society relationships. Um, so the question of thinking forward and thinking about sustainability transformations, it's not just what the humans do, but what is our kind of reworking, redes redesigned or rethought relationship with the more than human world as well. Um, so that that kind of leads, I, I kind of picked up from Sam's earlier intervention that we're going to talk about just transition. I thought I must say something about that in the final point. So I, I started thinking about like the kind of environmental justice idea. Um, and there's one kind of academic framework that I quite like that differentiates between what can be measured and what is the kind of norms, the values that underpin it. And I think there's an over, there's a huge amount of evidence about what we know and what we can see is unjust. You know, whether we're talking about the social distribution of benefits and harm from climate change, the, ex the rapid rates of extinction, you know, there's lots of measurements about things that are not seemingly fair. You know, so we're not short of that evidence. But I think to go back now to panel one, which was you know, a very you know, ambitiously designed panel thinking big, um, the comment, the, the idea of justice is really about the, the social values that underpin the judgments on those empirical things that we see. You know, so it's a norm, it's a value, it's about what we agree is fair and not fair. Um, so I think, what that means is that that judgment on what is just to go to your really interesting question, the challenge to us of what is a just transition is, well, you know, that emerges not from any one individual. Justice is relational. It's between you and me and between us and nature as well. So I think that the, the, my answer to your challenge would be that it's something that we explore together. There's not a single answer to it. But then it raises the question of the framing of our original, of our, the design of this, of this public seminar, which is, well, who gets to define just? I mean, that's, you know, that's then a power relationship. It's not, not everybody has an equal voice. Um, and that kind of leads to the, the final point that I want to make, which is, again, the premise of the workshop, that this needs to be a broad-based public discussion. And we've just heard on this panel, for example, how the decarbonized power development plan started from the point of having public discussions about the visions for energy sector. We have journalists in the room, like panel two was about the public debates that could be catalyzed about climate justice. So I think for me, that's the kind of final point I want to make to go to your question of what is just as well. Public discussion can work out what is just, I think, which I guess is an invitation to continue the discussion. Um, so I think can end there. I know we're a little bit over time. So thank you all of you for the last people standing for staying in the room. And uh, thank you again for joining. And I hope this will be a continued discussion into the future. Thank you.